pendulums are trippy and amazing but they can even get more amazing when you can make them procedurally and when you do that there's a ton of stuff that we can have control over like the speed of the pendulum you can make it fast or slow then its range of motion which can give some pretty awesome abstract renders and, and, and a lot more which is going to be pretty awesome i would say that this is a bit advanced tutorial but don't worry you'll do fine i guess so let's create this in blender so here i am in blender 2.93 I already modeled and shaded the pendulum which is pretty simple and I added them in a separate collection called instances. And this design really would vary from person to person so no case about here. Honestly this object could be anything. And if you want to follow along you can just download the model from the link in the description. Then I modeled the cylinder, rotated it 90 degrees on the x axis and moved it to a new collection called rod. So how exactly are we going to achieve this effect? Well we are going to do that in three phases. In phase one, we'll instance the objects. In phase two, we'll give it its rotation. And in phase three, we'll turn those rotations into waves. Yeah, as simple as that. Now, let's proceed to phase one, which is about instancing. So first, let's add in a cube or any other object really. Put it in a new collection called GeoNodes. Then let's open up a new geometry nodes tab and hit new. Delete the group input node and let's add in a line node and connect that to our group output. Yep, node wrangler works here too. Then let's add in a point instance node, select collection and choose our instances collection. Looks weird, not what we are after. Now to make it lie on the ground, let's add in a transform node, put it here and change the X rotation to 90. Let's set the count to 12 and offset to 0.46. There you go, that looks more like it. These values are what I used in my original animation but feel free to experiment, play around and put in your own values. Then let's disable the instances collection. Yeah, so that's it for phase 1 which is instancing. Now it's time we move on to phase 2, rotation. So to get the pendulum to rotate back and forth, we are going to make use of the trigonometric sine function. And it looks like this. A sine function or sine wave starts at a positive value 1 and then it goes down to a negative value minus 1 and then again it goes back up to positive 1 and it keeps on repeating that. And in Blender we have our math node which allows us to use this sine operation. All we have to do is keep feeding it numbers and the math node converts them into this sine wave and loops it between positive 1 and negative 1. So how are we going to use this for a rotation? Well, we simply have to add these sine values to our rotation. That's it. Then the pendulum will keep rotating between positive 1 and negative 1. And no, 1 doesn't mean 1 degree, it means 1 radian because that's what rotation vectors operate in. And the value of 1 radian is 57.296 degrees. So it, it kind of makes sense how it's rotating. So let's add in an attribute vector math node and put it here. We are using vector because rotation is a vector. Then let's change the operation to sine. Then change the a input to vector and write the result out to a new attribute sine. Then let's add another attribute vector math node. Make sure the blending mode is set to add. Then in our a input, let's put in the sine attribute we created a while ago. And in our b input, let's type rotation. This is a predefined attribute, so Blender knows what to do with it. And then let's write the result out rotation because that's what we want to affect. Let's hit play and nothing is happening. Why is that? Well, the sine operation here requires a constant change in these values over here. Right now they're all set to zero. But if I increase the y vector, you can see that things start to rotate. So let's control this by adding in a combine xyz node, connect that here, then let's add in a value node and connect that to the y input. This is because we want the pendulum to rotate on the y axis. This of course varies according to your scene. For some of you, it may be the x-axis. Anyway, let's type hash frame in our value node. Now, if we hit play, the pendulum starts to rotate, but it's way too fast. So to tone it down, let's add in a map range node here. Uncheck clamp, let's put 140 in the from max box. You can't really put any value here, but remember that the higher the value is here, the slower the rotation is going to be. 140 worked just fine for me. Then let's put in tau, in the 2 max box, 2 max box, this gives us the value of 2 pi. Why 2 pi? Because the value of one complete rotation is 
too far and we don't want the pendulum to go beyond that. This will also help us in looping things and it it will also help us in controlling the speed of the rotations. You, you can even use the value of pi but I'm gonna go with 2 pi. So now if we hit play, we can see that everything is working just fine. Yeah, so that's it for phase 2. Now that we have our rotation figured out, let's give the pendulum the waves effect. So let's go ahead and enjoy the phase 3. So if we take a look at our animation, we can see that there is an offset between each pendulum. And the offset keeps increasing as we go farther from the first pendulum. And as time passes by, the offset increases. So to achieve this effect, we have to add different values ranging from 0 to 1 to our sine operation, wherein the first pendulum gets the highest value and the last gets the lowest one. This way, we'll be creating this offset which will lead to the pendulum waves. As for why should we add to the sine function question, it is because the sine operation is what's changing the rotation. It is what is driving the animation. But wait a minute, how the hell are we going to create these values ranging from 0 to 1? There really is no node in here that does that. Not at the time of recording this tutorial anyway. But yeah, I, I found a way. Let's open up a new tab and switch it to the spreadsheet. Over here we can see all our values of all the attributes present on our geometry. But it's empty. So let's click on this monitor icon and now a bunch of attributes are available. Here we have the rotation values and you can see that all the points have the same values. And that's what we need to change. And here on the Z position we can see values ranging from 0 to 5.6. This is perfect. We can just add this Z position values to our rotation. But first we need to remap them so that they'll range from 0 to 1. So let's add in an attribute map range node before the sign operation. Set the type to vector and that is one big node. So let's move things a bit. Then under attribute let's put in position because that's what we want to remap. And then in the from max box let's type in 5.06 in the z vector, this last one. Everything else looks fine, these values are exactly what I want to remap to. Then if we write the result out to position itself, you'll see that everything is screwed up. That's because we just remapped the position values between 0 and 1. So instead, let's write the result out to a new attribute called new pause. Now, if we check the spreadsheet, we have a new attribute called new pause with all the positional values, but they are, but they are remapped from 0 to 1. Great. Now, what we have to do is add the new pause attribute to our incoming frames. Then those values will get converted into sine wave and then they'll be added to our rotation. Simple enough. But the values that we need are in the z vector of our position and the values that we want to affect are in the y vector of our rotation. So if we add them now, we'll get something like this, not what we're after. So all we need to do is switch the values between the z vector and the y vector in our new pause attribute. To do that, let's add in an attribute separate xyz node and put it here. Under attribute, let's type new pause. Then under result, type in pause x pause y and pause z respectively. There we go. We successfully separated them. Now we can control them individually. So let's add in an attribute combine x, y, z node, switch everything to attribute. Now under x type in pause x, under y type in pause z because that's what we wanted to switch and under z type in pause y. Then all that's left is to write the result out to a new attribute pause f for position flipped. So now we have pretty brilliantly flipped the values and we can see that in the spreadsheet here. Now we're pretty much done. Let's add the pause f attribute to our incoming friends. So add in an attribute vector math node, type pause f in the a input, set the second input to vector and write the result out to waves and check to make sure if the blending mode is set to add. Then let's instead connect the combine xyz output to this vector input and over here set the a input to attribute and type in waves attribute that we just created. So now we're calculating the sign of the waves attribute and the reason we're doing that is because the waves attribute contains the offset values that we so awesomely created. Now things change a bit. We can clearly see the offset happening but if we hit play it's doing something and it looks awesome but not exactly the effect that we're after. That's not how a pendulum behaves but feel free to render it out. Now let's fix this. The reason why this is happening is because even though we've remapped the values between 0 and 1, they're still constant, meaning that they don't change over a period of time. And to achieve this pendulum effect, we need them to continuously change. Only then will the pendulum keep rotating weirdly. So 
Let's go over here between the attribute combine nodes and add in an attribute math node. In the A input, type in pos z, then set the B input to float and write the result out to pos z itself. Then set the blending mode to multiply. Now everything just goes to the center line. That's cause we are multiplying it by zero. Let's change that by duplicating the map range and the value node here and connect the map range to the float input. And it looks like we lost our frame driver, so let's add it again. Now, if we hit play, boom, congrats, there you go. You just created a pendulum and that too, procedurally. How about that? So now that this effect is achieved, how about we make it more controllable and user friendly? Because if I increase the count value here, the highest Z position value also increases. Does that mean that I have to always dive in the geometry nodes tree and take a look at the spreadsheet and then manually type in the value in the from max box? Because if we don't update the remapping values, the values are going to overshoot beyond one. We don't want that. So we're going to have to keep updating it. And that's hectic as hell. But this video is all about proceduralism. So let's make this whole thing a bit interesting. So what's the relationship between the count and the position shared value? We know that as the count increases, the value of the Z position also increases. But by how much? The answer is 0.46, the value of the offset. So if we multiply the value of the count by the value of the offset, we should be getting the highest position value, right? Let's test this. So let's multiply 12 by 0.46 and we get 5.52 as our answer. But the highest value is 5.06. So what if we do wrong? Well, if we take a look at the spreadsheet, we can see that at the extreme left, we have a bunch of numbers from 0 to 11. These are the total points on our geometry. But the count here says it's 12. What's going on? Well, the count here is right. We do have 12 points, but Blender is not calculating them from 1 to 12. It's calculating them from 0 to 11, which is 12. So yeah, whole number, those guys. Anyway, all we have to do is subtract 1 from the count and then multiply that with the offset value. Let's try that. 11 multiplied by 0 0.46 and we get 5.06 as our answer. There we go. That was pretty smart, huh? Anyway, let's do this in our node tree. So add in a geometry group input node, then connect the count to the empty socket here. Then let's hit N to bring up this menu. Here we can rename things and stuff, but right now let's leave it at count. Now we can see the value is exposed on our modifier. Anyway, let's add in a combine XYZ node and connect that to the offset then type whatever value you had in the z vector over here in my case it's 0.46 and then connect that to the empty socket as well and let's name it as offset now let's duplicate the combine xyz node and connect that to the 2 max vector inputs now let's do the math add in a math node connect the count and the offset outputs here and set the operation to multiply and then connect that to the z input here but remember, we have to subtract one from the count. So let's add in a math node again and put it between the count and the multiply node. Then change the operation to subtract and set the value to one. There we go. Now let's go to the modifier panel. And if we change the value of the count, the from max value of the Z position updates automatically. So go ahead and keep exposing values which you think are important and to make things even more interesting, add in a attribute vector math node after the sign operation. Then let's write sign in the A input and change the B input to vector and write the result out to sign itself and set the operation to multiply. Nothing is happening yet, but if I change the value to one here in the Y rotation and if I hit play, you can see that the range of the swing has increased. So let's expose these values as well and name it swing control. So now we can even control the swing. How awesome is that? Let's try typing some values here and take a look. Yeah, that's pretty awesome. So for those of you who want to make a looping animation out of this, just set the frame to zero. You'll see why. And with this current settings, set the end frame to 1539, which is like 1539. I know a lot of frames, but with EV, this is going to render in no time. The end frame will change, of course, as you change these settings. Then all that's left is lighting and shading the scene. The shading part is actually not that complicated, just mixing between two shaders, that's it. And for the background, I'm simply using some textures, that's it. 
As for the lighting, I ended up going with two point lights. This part would depend upon the mood or feeling you're trying to convey. I wanted to set the mood to something dark and magical, so yeah, take your time here. Then I rendered my scene in EV and it was surprisingly very good. So when you're done with all this, do send me your render. Here are my Instagram and Twitter handles, I even have a Discord server, so be sure to check it out. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this, I'll see you in the next one. Until then, be infinite.